many of you think the world is messed up today? They'd all raise their hands. One is they knew that if they walked out of that building, that as a Christian, there's a good chance that somebody was going to take their lives. And so today I'm starting a series called The Supremacy of Jesus. We're looking at the book of Colossians. In the weeks to come, if you want to bring your Bible, if you're a guest here today, we always provide notes. Uh, all of the scriptures I think I'm using today are in your notes, and we have blanks to fill in. But if you want to bring your Bible, and because you won't have to jump around, we'll be in Colossians, do that. But, but I always encourage you to read and study the Word of God at home, and uh, because that foundation is so important. The world doesn't want... Christians to be Christians. They want, they don't want to do away with Christianity. They want Christians to be a mix, the Christian faith to be a mix of so many other things. But what we have to always remember is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. So I'm going to pray. If you'd look around you just a minute and pick somebody out, in your mind, and as I pray for y'all, would you pray for them? Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can always rely on you. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that, um, that lives can be changed through our commitment with you, that, that when we commit to you, we, we have your spirit interacting with us and helping us make decisions and helping us discover truths in your word. And Lord, today I pray that I, I give Jesus honor as we teach from this very important book of the Bible. And Lord, I pray today for whatever's worrying, whatever somebody's struggling with, whatever, Lord, that, that today you'll show them a way to have peace by relying on you and, and, and fill your presence as they listen to your word today. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this is the supremacy of Jesus. It's a study of Colossians, and I'm calling today's message, Jesus is the answer. I'll be in Colossians 1, 1 through 8, if you do have your Bibles or want to look away. But like I said, all, all the notes are you have in hand. Three questions I always present. I'm a teacher, and uh, I think if I teach and you don't learn anything, then it's a failure for me. But, but I know that it helps. We've got three questions we look at. If, if you go to one of our life groups, uh, you'll see that this is one of the questions in our life groups that they discuss when they get together during the week. But these three questions help us look and, and, and decide what God wants us to learn out of that. What point in this message is most impactful for you? How does it challenge, change, or affirm your thinking? And how will you put into practice what you learned today? That's my goal. That's my goal for you, is that you can do that. But I want to start off with this line, which is very important. Jesus is the supreme and sufficient Christ. He's the supreme and sufficient Christ. He's over everything. Uh, he created everything. He's all we need to handle every single problem that we have in this world. He is all you need to solve the problems of this world. You know, one of the things I hear Christians complain about all the time is, is uh, uh, the world would just be better if we had prayer in schools. Have you heard that? If we had prayer in schools, the world would be better. Well, I want to just tell you a secret. If your children are in school, there's prayer in school. If you teach your Christian children, here, here's, here's what Christians don't think about when we think about the mix of, of religions and all. If there was prayer in school and there was a Muslim principal, your kids would be praying to Allah. And that's getting pretty common. So we've got to realize that, that Christ is in our life, God is in our life because he's in our life. We're in him and he is in us. Christ, in Colossians 1.15, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Let me say that again. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all of creation. And then in Acts chapter 4, and, and 
And, and Acts is the story of really the beginning of the church. If you look in Acts chapter 2, it describes the church and how the church is growing just because Christians were being Christians and, and God was blessing them. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. You know, I talk to people all the time that um, throughout my life, one is I talk to Christians who go, well, I'm a Christian, but I'll get serious about God when I get older. I hear, I've heard that a billion times. None of y'all have said that to me, but I've heard that over and over and over again. And, and, and I've heard people say, you know, I, I believe in Jesus, but, but I, I'm not willing to make that commitment yet. It's so important if you haven't made that commitment. If we found out anything during the pandemic, anybody can leave us at any time, any time. Who do you know that needs to know? Who do you know that needs to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Now, what was happening in the church of Colossae, the church of Colossae had problems with a mix of other religions that was poisoning their Christian faith. Now, now this was this was happening in a lot of the churches back then. As a matter of fact, when you look at the seven churches in the book of Revelations, uh, John, God says, Jesus says to John, he says, you're good at this, but this. You're good at this. In all seven churches, he tells them the things that they're doing wrong. So, so, so there's kind of a mix of things that are going on. There's, there's a mix of things that are going on in the church today. And what ends up happening is it, is it poisons the purity of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But the church had major problems. It was no longer all about Jesus. You can say, uh-oh. It was no longer all about Jesus. And I think there's, nowadays, we, we struggle with that a lot. The, the, there was crisis that was going on in the church. The first one is, they, they still had Jewish legalism. Now, what's interesting is, um, the church of Colossae was actually um, more of a Gentile church than a um, uh, than a church with a bunch of Jews that had become Christians. But what happens is, as we saw in other churches, as the Christian churches are getting started, the Jewish people were going, look, we do need Jesus, but we also need this. You need to be circumcised. Can you imagine being 40 years old and you get saved and they ask you to get circumcised? That's a, that's a pretty scary thing. But, but there was Jewish legalism and, and laws, laws on how you work and laws on how you eat, all of those things that they brought into it. They also had Eastern philosophy. Uh, I'm sorry, go on to the next one. They also had Eastern philosophy that was, that was happening. Um, but then Gnosticism, this is the craziest one of all. Gnosticism, the Gnostics were people who claimed to be in the know. I am in the know. And if you're not in the know, then you're not very close to God. Then you're not superior. And you have to do these certain kind of things to get to the point where, where you can be in the know as well. Now, they're teaching this, and they're teaching this in a Christian church where they've already learned that, um, they've already learned that Jesus is supreme. The Gnostics, um, they... they, they built their religious philosophies on this question. You ready? Why is there evil in this world if creation was made by a holy God? Human philosophy. So then God must not have created the world. God must not really be God. God must, as a matter of fact, the, the Gnostics taught that there were a bunch of um, angel spiritual people that flew around everywhere and created the world. Now, can you imagine? Now, it might have been easier to pass that off back then, but how many of y'all think that angel people ran around spiritual people and created the world, right? Even, even when you ask... Um, most people, even if they're not Christians, they believe that God, but, but they had two major opinions. One is because everything is evil and everything was bad. One thing is, is they became very, very, very religious. They would become so religious that they did things to hurt themselves and, and, and they tried to follow all the rules. But then there was another one that said, look, if everything is evil, then we'll just be evil. That's just the way it is. We'll, we'll live and we'll believe, and, but we'll just be evil. We'll use our bodies any way that we want to. 
we need to understand that Jesus settled that question of the problem in the world. Jesus settled that question of how to connect with God and how to be changed. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They just believed that he was one of the other angel-type spiritual people that went around and, and fixed and, and created the world. They had strange um, ast astrologies that they used. They, they poisoned the doctrine. They taught you that you could be fully spiritual, fully knowledgeable, because it was all about what you knew and nobody else knew. You could be fully knowledgeable, fully spiritual, and reach this level of knowing that regular people just can't understand. Does that sound familiar at all today? Are there people teaching things today that we're going, what, what? And they're looking at us and going, you just can't know. Gnosticism means in the know. You're in the know, and you're a special person if you're in the know. And the more you get in the know, the more spiritual you're, you're going to be. We live as people, more than people ever have, I think, in the age of reason. Some people are in the know, and others are not. Science. How many of y'all think science came to a whole new level of importance in the last three years? You know, science, science is, is what's important. Science has become the savior. The problem is these scientists say this thing and these scientists say this thing. And you're not in the know if you don't pick the science that says this thing. That makes me superior to you because I know what the right science is. And then look what Paul wrote in chapter 2. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world. What are the spiritual powers of this world? They're, they're the devil, right? If you remember when, when the devil, or, or if you don't know, when the devil was uh, an angel and he was kicked out of heaven, God gave him earth. He said, here, have earth. Go for it. That's, that's what you can do. And that's why he sent Jesus to fix that for us. But we need to realize that the church is always being attacked spiritually. We will always be attacked spiritually. We're dealing with times of people who believe that they're in no and that we are not in the no. Scripture says there are ways that seem right that lead to death. Now, there are things that we think, uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong. Sometimes, depending on how I feel is how I think. Does anybody else struggle with that? I'll just give you an example of this. Uh, this there are ways that seem right, but they lead to spiritual death um, or to death. Uh, Lisa and I, we were in here this morning, and uh, I got here, and I was a little anxious, and I'd eaten something that made me sick at my stomach, and, and I was not being very nice. And I kind of griped at her, and she came and said, you griped at me, and I died. I mean, you know, <laughs> there are things that seem right. It seemed right at that time. Have you ever said something out of anger or something that just seems right? But then, but then also when you start thinking of things like, gosh, abortion, it seems right. It's easy to make it seem right. I've heard so many honest, loving, caring people say it seems right. And what we have to realize when we're dealing with people who think about anything different than what the Word of God says about things, we've got to realize that they're not really in the know because they don't have God telling them the know. Does that make sense? That doesn't mean we judge them. It doesn't mean we treat them meanly. It doesn't mean we argue with them. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do with someone who doesn't believe the way we do? We love them. We love them. That's important. There's an old saying that says, um, share the gospel, but sometimes use words. Now, that sounds cool, doesn't it? Isn't that a cool thing? But it's not really true. We should be using our words all the time. We should be loving, and we should be using our words. And, and what people often think is uh, there are people around them who don't know about the love of God, and they don't know because we don't tell them. 
The only way, Scripture says, the only way people know is because they're told. They're told. Now, people are drawn. Scripture doesn't say that God tells them. Scripture says that he draws them to somebody who knows Jesus. So you might have somebody in your office that the purpose of them working at that company in that office and sitting two cubicles over and going to break time at the same time as you, God may have put them in your path for you to tell them about Jesus one day. And that's, that's love. That's love. You don't judge them for that you, because they don't know. They're, they're not in the know. Now, interesting thing, uh, Epaphras started the church in Colossae. And, and the church in Colossae was about 100, 100 to 150 miles away from Ephesus. Well, when the apostle Paul was in Ephesus teaching and all these people were getting saved, Epaphras, Epaphras, Epaphras got saved. And then he got discipled by Jesus. And then he went back to his town of Colossae and he started the Colossian church. So this church is literally two years old, and they're already having problems. They're two years old. They're not very spiritually mature. They're only two years old. They're, they're still being discipled, and, and, and people are coming in, and they're going, look, we're not, we're not going to let Christianity take over this town. We've got to, now, we're not going to kick Christianity out. We're going to let them believe in Jesus, but we're going to put other things in there. Jesus is just going to be a part of the mix. I hope Jesus just isn't your part of the mix. Because Jesus is the supreme. He's sufficient. He's every single thing that we need. Now, here's an interesting thing. Epaphras, the pastor, the planter, church planter, he decides one day, I got to get help. I'm going to go get Paul, and I'm going to get him to write a letter to our church. So watch this. Epaphras traveled 1,300 miles to Rome. 1,300 miles. Actually, I looked it up. Some pastor said 1,300. It's about 1,248. It's a little bit shorter than that. But Epaphras traveled 1,300 miles to Rome. He came to Paul. He told them everything that was going on. And then Epaphras stayed there with Paul in Rome, who was in prison at the time. Paul wrote the letter, and then two other guys took it back. That's how important it was to Paul. That's how important it was to the pastor of that church to, to fix the problem. And the letter that we have in, right now that's just four chapters is so full of things that are the basics of our faith. But we're going to learn uh, as we look, just like the church in Colossae did. Look at this. 1,300 miles from Colossae. To there. So maybe donkey, maybe camel. I, I don't know, but that's a long way, right? I, I, I actually put it in my, in my Google Maps, and it did say how many, oh, it takes 261 hours to walk that far, just in case. So if y'all plan on doing a little bit of, of a, a cardio, then it's, it's only 261 hours. You can stop every 30 minutes. That'd probably make it a little bit longer. But, 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 but isn't that crazy? Can you imagine that somebody was that, uh, that it was that important? And then on top of that, to get there, and then there's these two guys that are working with Paul, and, and Epaphras tells them the story, this is what happened, and, and the Gnostics are coming in, and, and people are telling us this, and they're telling us that there's really no such thing as that Jesus really isn't the Son of God, and, and, and all these other faiths are, are coming in, these other different philosophies, and then there were still two guys that were willing to go back the 1,300 miles to take it. And all God's asking you to do is tell the guy two cubicles over about Jesus. That's it. That's it. Now, we could do the 1,300-mile thing, but, but you got to stop at every Bucky's on the way and tell everybody, give them, what do they call them, beaver nuggets, and tell them about Jesus. I'll give you more beaver nuggets if you, t if you let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> verse 2. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ 
and from our brother Timothy. So they're there in jail. So now we're going to go into verses um, 3 through 8, and I'm going to just talk about Jesus being the answer. These are the basics, and then we're going to get into more things as we go through the chapters. But, but this, is how, this is how these people became Christians. This is how all people become Christians. I'm sorry, here's verse 2. We are writing to God's only people in the city of Colossae who are faithful and brothers and sisters in Christ. Go ahead and skip to the next. They heard the good news. The only way you can become a Christian is hear the good news. I shared this with y'all maybe a couple of times, but I think it's interesting as I'm reading about Muslims in other parts of the world. They're telling missionaries when they come to them, and I don't know if if you've seen that on your missionary trips at all, but they're telling people when they come to them, a man in white came to me in my dreams and said you were coming. Now, the man in white didn't tell them about Jesus. They think it was Jesus. They think Jesus did come because Scripture says that we're drawn to, to ask about God by Jesus. But these people, they've all heard the good news. The good news is, is that whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. And you have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. One of the things, I hope you experience this. If, if not, it, One of the things I love about being a believer in Jesus Christ is the sense of God's presence. You know what I'm talking about? Um, Sometimes it's a still, small voice. Sometimes it's it's big, it's huge, it's there when you make a decision. Sometimes it's, it's when you're in the middle of the night and, and your, ang- your anxiety is just completely taking over and, and you just start saying the Lord's Prayer or you just say, thank you, God. Or, and all of a sudden, you, you feel God there comforting you. Now, that's a presence you don't have without Jesus and the Holy Spirit in your life. Salvation is God. God's work and human's work. God leads people to a human. So again, I'm going to ask you, are you that human? Now, if you want to, you can call me and we'll go to lunch and I'll help you tell somebody about Jesus. But look around the room, even a church our size, I would get nothing else done because it's all of our jobs to do that. It's all of our jobs to tell people about the Jesus and the love of Jesus and how it changed our lives. The outsiders were trying to remove Jesus. Now, they weren't removing him completely, and that's why sometimes it sounds like, well, it must be okay. It must be okay to mix this with that. we, We can have Jesus and this not according to Jesus, not according to the Word of God. It's, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And I'm sure the people in Colossae weren't sitting around thinking, hmm, this, this can't be right. No, what they're thinking is, it seems right. And then when Pastor Epaphras came to him and said, you know, this, this isn't, this isn't, it's Jesus and not that. And they're going, no, I, I, think, I think it seems right. I think it's okay. It's so important for us to realize that, that once you dilute it, you're no longer, it's just Jesus. It becomes everything else. And really, the devil's smart. The devil's smart because, because he knows all he's got to do is get you sidetracked. Just get you sidetracked just a little bit. And, and we see things. We, we watch social media all the time. We, we watch TV all the time. We watch things that are constantly... Oh, that seems all right. That seems all right. And, and it changes the way we think. That's why it's so important that foundationally that we are in the Word of God, that we are learning God's Word, that we are practicing and doing the things that God wants us to do, that we're part of a church that teaches the Word of God and, and that we come together as believers and we learn from each other and we disciple. It's important that we do those things because then when we do, the thing that this person who's been away from God is going, well, I think this is okay. I, I think this is all right. You can go... No, it's not. And you won't be drawn into it because that's the way the devil works. The devil, Scripture says that the devil travels around like a a roaring hunting lion and he's looking for the weak. 
He's looking for the weak. And he wants to take you out. Now, if you're one that's been taken out, you probably aren't here. (laughs) But if you're one that's been taken out, all it takes is turning back. That's all it takes. All it takes is, it's called repentance. All it takes is turning from what you've been doing and going back and committing to what you're going to do with God. Separation from God messes with us so bad that we stop seeing the things in life that are wrong with us. It's not our job to judge other people, but it's important for us to live our lives right. And then when we get to opportunity to tell that to other people, that we tell them God is present. You know, God is present at all times. If you're sitting in here today and you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, you you don't know anything about Christianity, you're here today to figure out what's going on, you're here today because you want to find God, He's there. There's not any place that's any farther away or closer to God because God's everywhere. Now, the difference in just God being there and the manifestation of God's Spirit is completely different. That's when you interact with him, and that's when you feel his presence, and and that's when you get this extra wisdom that comes from God. Colossians 1.5 again, you have had this expectation since you first heard the truth of the good news. It is truth. It is truth. John 17.17, sorry, this is one that's not in your notes, says the word of God is truth. When we experience the truth of God's word, we experience real life in the presence of God. So it's God's truth, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And I think I've skipped ahead pretty far. Next one, please. It's God's grace. It's God's grace. Now, we often confuse mercy with grace. Oh, God, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Get, 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 get. You know, mercy is when God doesn't give us something that we deserve. You know, um, uh, you're speeding. Police officer looks right at you. Now, I'm just saying this because somebody else told me this is what happens when you're driving. But I'm speeding. The police officer looks right at you. He goes. And lets you go. That's mercy. Mercy is when you don't give something, something to someone they should have. When, um, when I'm praying for people now that, that are, are ill or um, have cancer or, uh, and they, even, they, they know that the next thing that's going to happen is that they're going to go to heaven. You know what I pray for? I pray for mercy. God, would you give them mercy? Would you help them not have the pain that, they need, that, that they're going through? Would you, would you end it quickly for them? That's the prayer. And it sounds kind of weird when, when, I, when a family member asks me to pray for someone and, and I pray for mercy and they're going, why aren't you praying for a miracle? Well, I'm praying for a miracle too, but, but I'm praying for mercy that you don't have to deal with what, what you've got going on. And then there's God's grace. God's grace, God gives us something that we don't deserve. Jesus died on the cross for you and me. Now, we don't deserve that. But he did it for us. That's grace. And then, and then the good news is for all people. It is for all people. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it's that boss you don't like. It, it doesn't matter if that's guy on the TV that's yelling and, and, and being mean to Christians. It, 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 does, it doesn't matter that it's anybody. God, is, Jesus is for all of us. Jesus and Jesus' grace is for all of us. The believer, the, they believed in Jesus Christ. They believed in Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Apostle Paul, now, if you don't know, this is, the Apostle Paul was a type A individual. Before he became Paul, he was a guy named Saul who was Jewish, and his job that he took on himself, he went to the government, and he, and he said, let me go get the Christians and take them out. So Saul was doing that when God actually, when Jesus actually came to him 
on the road, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, and then he got saved and became Paul and started going around starting the church. So he was a type A personality. He was the kind of person who makes things happen. But he also had a way of doing that. When you look at the letters, he always starts off with telling them the good things that they're doing. I'm talking to the Christians, and I'm telling the good things that they're doing. For we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's peop people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. Now, it's interesting because what we have to be careful of when we're talking to our friends about Jesus, we, we just can't use, people can't relate to heaven. We got to realize when Jesus is in our life, in the spirit in our life, Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven to earth. You know that, right? He brought that to earth. And we are, as Christians, our home is where? Right? You can say heaven. You can say heaven if you want to. I'm thinking, man, have I never taught that? Our, our home is heaven. Our home is heaven. And so we're just travelers here. And, and what we have to be careful of, we, we can't be like a, an immigrant who comes in and, and their job is to become a part of, of who they are and, and change and, and be like them. We're to be Jesus' love represented here on earth, knowing that heaven is where we go. And we bring heaven to others here on earth. There's nothing more cool than watching somebody make that decision in their life. There's nothing more cool than being a pastor and walking through somebody. We've had so many people over the years that, that have gone through horrible, horrible things, and it's been amazing watching them live heaven out here on earth because they had peace because of their relationship with Jesus as they went through those things. And then it's our job when they're struggling with that peace to help them have peace as well. They show great love for other people. That, that's what's always going to come out with a close relationship with Jesus. If you have a close relationship with Jesus, then you will be loving other people. And they look forward to the great future in heaven and on earth. I don't know about you, but my life changed so drastically. I love uh, I'm just, Miguel. I went to lunch with Miguel a week ago, two weeks ago, and he just sat there. He was just, I mean, he's been brought up by two good parents. He's in a good family. He's got support from friends and family and all that. And all of a sudden, he's going, because he's making this recommitment to God, he's going, okay, I, I want to do things right now. And, and there's more of a sense of doing things right. He, he starts, you start making decisions. Who, what kind of people am I going to hang out with? And, and, and what, kind of, what am I going to do for discipleship? How am I going to bless other people? How am I going to be in ministry? Those are things you do. And then you start thinking, as you start thinking about where you want to go and what you want to do with the rest of your life, I don't care how old you are today. If today for the first time you say, from now on, my commitment is to Jesus, period. I can't tell you what God's going to do with you. There is no way in the world that I would have thought that I would be standing up here leading a church for 23 years, 22 years. That wasn't on my radar at all. And what you find out is when you make a, a recommitment, it's spiritually, God puts things on your radar. I've told you all this. People come to me all the time and go, you know what? They'll get inspired and they'll come to me and they'll go, you know, well, I think God really wants something big for me. I think he really wants to do something big for me. I'm, I'm going to start looking for something big. And my answer is always, because <laughs> I'm a party pooper, is are you doing the little things? Are you doing the little things? Because God's not going to give you more than you can do. And it's not just a spiritual thing. It's, a, it's an act of, of obedience in, in such a way that you're ready for the next thing that he throws at you. I promise you, I promise you. I've had people go, I don't, I don't know if I want to commit my life to Christ because I don't want to go be a missionary in Africa. I've never met a missionary that wasn't so excited to go to Africa. None of them were going, oh, gosh, I wish God hadn't called me to this. You know, I, I just can't believe that I'm doing this. I wonder if he can send me to England. You know what I'm saying? I mean, no, they get that feeling. The, 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 the uh, couple, the family that we just started supporting as a church um, that, that's going um, 
gosh, I can't remember where they're going. It's the northern part of Africa. Uh, they, they thought they were, going to, they were going to China. They thought that forever. And then God changed everything. Guess what? They're just as excited about going to Africa as they were to go there. God changes things. As you move forward, God will move things and change things in ways that you ever thought. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul kept praying, why can't I get to Rome? Why am I not going to Rome? I keep praying and I don't get to Rome. You know why? He wanted to go stand on the corners and preach. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he thought God was calling him to do. And guess what happened? Instead of going to Rome as a preacher, he went to Rome as a prisoner. And while there, they put him under house arrest, and he had access to all the higher-ups of the city of Rome. And he got to share the gospel with the leaders instead of just anybody. I and mean, that's, just, that's, just that's just the way that God works. But that commitment from you has to come first, and you have to start off with the little things, the little commitments that you know you got to do. You know it's that way with dieting. It's that way with anything. Anything that you want, anything that you need to make a habit, that you need to make a way of life, you have to start off doing the little things. And, and he says, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of God's news. So God's, Paul's saying, you know, God's using you and you're there. They made new disciples. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world through them. As we read again, like I said, Acts chapter 2, when the church is just being the church, God uses them to grow. Just a, a, three more verses here. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. If, if, one of the things we have to be careful of, it, I, I, there are people, we get nervous about sharing our faith. I told you all this a couple of weeks ago. I used to sell cars, and, and, and it got, it, that was hard work. That was really, really, really hard work. But it's not hard work to share your faith if you're living your faith out. That's just, that, that's just the way it works. But, but as, you, as you start to change, you, you tell people about your change, and then you get a chance to tell them about Jesus. Just as it changed your lives from the day you heard and understood about God's wonderful grace. Verse 7. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, the one who went 1,300 miles to get Paul, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. And then verse 8, he has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. If you're a guest here today, and this is how I teach I have times where I teach um, what you would call topical studies, how to be this, how to be that, how to get over this, how to whatever. But then I love getting back into the Word of God because it's so easy when you're teaching topical to just pull things out and pull things out. And, and I see, I, I, I kind of got this uh, thing about pastors using text out of context. I can't use text out of context when I'm teaching through a book of the Bible. So we're going to go through it, and we're going to learn some amazing things, some things that will help us deal with the stuff that you're dealing with today, the, the people who are in the know. I won't use the other word that people are using for those people, but I, I think you know what I'm talking about. The, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? The way you do that is you become solid in your faith. Can I pray for you? Father, we just come to you this morning, and I thank you so much for sending us Jesus. I'm thankful that we have your word that we can always rely on, that's always truth, that no matter what our age is, from, from young adult to old adult, at any time as we commit our life to you, you change us. You change us first by, by um, releasing our guilt by, by through your grace, by loving us and us getting your, and receiving your spirit, and then us being able to live for you instead of against you, live your word instead of against your word. Lord, be comfortable in 
not comfortable is not the right word, be um, confident in our ability to know you better because we know your word better for our confidence in, in serving you and being who you want us to be in our work and where we play and everything else that we do. Lord, I just thank you for that. I pray that as a church, Jesus is always in the center and the head of Life Connection Church. I pray that you continue to bless us. I pray for anyone in here today, Lord, that, that's thinking, ah, I need to make that decision. I pray for the ability before they leave here today to say, Lord, I'm following you starting right now for the rest of my life. I'm committing my life to you no matter what the age. And Lord, for those of us who have just kind of been on the fence and we're just kind of going, well, that's okay, that's okay, Lord. I pray that we take great stock, uh, great confidence, great uh, humility in our knowing what your word is, not being in the know of science or in the know of other philosophies of this earth, but in the know of knowing you. And I thank you for that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.